welcome to episode nine of Cocktails and Compliance. We are live at Resmania. We are so excited to be here. It's amazing how you offer a cocktail and it'll fill a room. Uh, so I am Janelle. Thank you. That's That was HR, by the way, that just cheered me from the back. So shout out, Eric. Thank you. Uh, so as Dimitri said, I am Janelle. I am joined as always by my uh, partner in crime, Rue Fox. But today we have some extra special people. And guys, I know this thing clips, but it doesn't clip high enough so that it's loud. So forgive me while I hold this little thing. So we are excited to have Scott Michael Dunn, not to be confused with our Michael Dunn. This is Scott Michael Dunn, who is the CEO and owner of Costello Compliance. And we also have Lane Hurst, who is Vice President of Affordable Property Management for Burgeon Held. So again, super excited uh, to have both of them join us. Um, it's already gotten a little silly before anybody took a sip, so uh, buckle in, it's gonna be a good time. It wouldn't be cocktails and compliance without a cocktail. So, Miss Rue, what do we have today? We have a no place like home. Pineapple margarita with a tahini rim. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, no judgment if you just walked in the room and you need to come up front. We're going to be like, hey, come get one because somebody's got to do a lot of drinking. There's a lot of drinks up here. You know what, Corbin? If you need to, get two. There's no judgment in here today. Um, did I mention well HRs well in the done. back of the room? Just keep it classy. <laughs> The good news is it's our HR and not yours, so y'all are all good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Customers, you're good. Resman people, just remember the speeches we've had for the last week. So, all right. Well, I am excited. Um, we have been chatting, and in fact, last night at dinner, these guys got excited about stuff. I'm like, y'all need to tap the brakes and save it for the podcast uh, because they are super passionate. We have a couple of hot topics in the industry that we want to talk about today. Um, neither of them are very shy. And if you have questions, even though normally we would do this in studio, we like doing it live. And if you have questions, by all means, if your question is, can I have another cocktail? The answer is always yes. So we want to talk about Hotma today. How many affordable people in the room have heard of Hotma? Keep your hand up if you're scared. <laughs> okay. All right. So a lot of the time we talk about Hotma, and I'm going to single out Jenny De Silva sitting there. Jenny and I are going to talk about Hotma a little bit more tomorrow. Um, but we tend to focus more on the HUD side of Hotma. Scott Michael is going to tell us about what is scary or good on the tax credit side of Hotma. Well, let's see. First of all, I'm a compliance guy, so we're kind of afraid of things, right? That's our nature. That great modern masterpiece of filmmaking, The Croods, tells us the warning parable of the caveman who saw something new and died. And we in compliance think that's going to happen every time there's something new. We like it the way it is. We, 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 we like things to be the way they've always been. Well, that's not going to be able to, to continue this year uh, with Hotma coming up. But... There are many positive things. Not like with anything, there are some things, maybe unintended negative things, but um, I think that we need to realize that for the most part, their goal is to simplify life for the managers, owner agents, sites, tenants, uh, and our employees. And in, in many ways, that they, they've accomplished that. So that's one thing we need to, to, I think, frame this discussion with, right? There's some good and there's some bad, but um, we can handle it. If we went through the HERA, Housing and Economic Recovery Act, in 2008, we got through it. It was a total reformation of the tax credit program. This is kind of similar on the HUD side, um, but we're just looking at a certain portion of this because the tax credit program, like uh, rural development and home and so many other programs, rather than develop their own income and asset rules, they take from HUD. So that section of the rules that affect how we cal calculate income and assets that will change Things on the HUD side will also change things on the tax credit side. So that is uh, the same across the board. There are some things we won't have, like the asset limitation, the $100,000 asset limitation, uh, the limitation on real estate, owning real estate that could be suitable for occupancy. So some of those things are not things that we'll be concerned with, uh, certainly on the home side because the regulation tells us so, but the tax credit side as well. 
But I also like to talk about this as an opportunity on the tax credit side. Anyone who knows anything about tax credits, and this is one of the things that the HUD camp and the tax credit camps, although there's a lot of overlap there, right? The HUD side says it's so unregulated over there. It's like every state does whatever they want. Wahoo, right? And that's, they don't, that's true, though. Yes, it is. That's true. <laughs> they don't like that. Now, that's not a bug. That's a feature. That is part of what the program with the tax credit program tried I'm to sorry. do. You sound like you're in product for a minute there. It's but, up, I know. I know. Okay. Marketing for the tax credit program. They decided to do that on purpose, and it was about states' rights as well as working with a federal backbone. So that's part of the, the design of the tax credit program. That being said, I feel HOTMA is an opportunity perhaps to move a little toward a little more uniform approach. Because the HUD program is going to allow HUD, CBRA in particular, also a voucher, to use tax credit determinations of income. Problem is that we've all come up with all these very conservative methods on the tax credit side, which could make a difference of many, many dollars in terms of rent on the, the, the HUD side if we're going to use our tax credit calculations. Now, I don't think state agencies have created these restrictive policies for the most part to, to sort of keep people out of housing. It's been fear, right? Fear of the investors and um, or the invest, investor-driven fear to make sure that we're just not running any risks that we'll have an over-income household. But now we have a countervailing risk that we'll be treating people unfairly, that their rents will not be calculated in a manner consistent with Section 8 on the HUD side, we're supposed to always have been calculated income in a manner consistent with Section 8 on the tax credit side. We just have sort of created these methods because we felt it didn't matter, right? Well, so what if we use year-to-date, annualized, compare that to actual and use whichever is higher? Like we're just looking for the highest possible calculation. And now I think we have the possibility that it will matter. It will have a much more significant impact on the constituents of the state agencies and the people that are perhaps having their income, their rent calculated based on this. So I think our discussion on the tax credit side is going to be very heavily uh, about how can we make sure we're a little more consistent in order to make sure we're fairly treating tax credit tenants and tax credit with HUD tenants to make sure it's consistent. Sounds good. Lane, how about you? What are your thoughts on HOTMA? For me, it's a, it's a very welcome change. I mean, I know that the software companies out there are certainly worried about the short time frame of implementation and the ways that we are going to have to implement it out in the field. But other than folks that have always done things a certain way, for me, it's, it's a welcome change because if done right at the site, it should create a little bit less work um, in the day to day. For you guys here, your software company is not afraid. <laughs> I put my hand down after I said, raise your hand for hot mud, keep it up. We are not afraid. <laughs> We've Can been I paying just, attention. I'll just throw something out there. Let's just have one positive here. Imagine a world where you never count a retirement account as an asset. It's only income. Yeah. If they start withdrawing from it, it's never an asset. Does that simplify your life? We've been trying to figure out how do you calculate income on these stock-based 401ks, and there's really no, been no good way to do that. It's going to go away January 1st. So let's just give some a round of applause, led by Jenny here. Yeah, I was going to say, why is it just the trainer yeah, in the room that's Jenny clapping? I'm like, why isn't everybody else going? That'd be amazing. Thank you. It will happen. Awesome. Awesome. I also love how when you were talking about that, you talked about unintended negative consequences. I was like, that's so cute. <laughs> that was really cute. That was a really nice way of putting it. I like being adorable. That was that was very adorable. That was awesome. Adorbs. That was awesome. Um, so Scott, when we were prepping for this, you also mentioned that you've been doing a lot of work with the state agencies, talking about you know who's going to adopt what, how's this going to work. Tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Well, say so even prior to Hotma, the trend along the lines of what I just talked about has been to go away from the arch conservative method. About seven states have gotten rid of uh, counting the highest in an average. Uh, several have gotten rid of an, a mandatory year-to-date calculation where it might be a red flag, but not necessarily your final determine there. Um, we have more and more states that have been positioning themselves in a place where they could legally in court say, yeah, we calculate income in a manner consistent with Section 8 because the suits have started to come. And so as state agencies have started making these adjustments already, and I think HOTMA will just accelerate that, uh, that discussion. Good. 
Lane, what are you guys doing to get ready for Hotma? Uh, besides drinking, because clearly <laughs> this helps. I'm like, dang, that helps. Though. No judgment, though. I, personally, I, we've we've strictly been focused on just educating ourselves. We, I think, because our organization is so limited in the space, specifically with Section Eight, that we don't focus as much as I think we should, and mainly because, not for nothing, y'all, my company doesn't use Resmin, and... We still I, like you anyway. They still love me, and I appreciate that. But the company that we use is very ill-prepared, and I am, and have been for probably three months now, trying to get them on the phone with the rest of our colleagues to try and figure out a solution that is going to support our single property that we have that is 100% uh, Section 8. Um, and it is it is frightening because they don't have the answers that you would hope a multi-billion dollar organization would have um, that we need to know to be able to support our folks in the field. So I that's the best I can offer. Hopes and prayers is what I just Hopes heard. Hopes and prayers. Hopes and prayers. That's right. I think in any situation where there's change, right? We've just gone through several years of unending change, right? Constant challenges that we've been facing. And there's always that fear reaction first, right? The, yeah, someone saw something new and died reaction. The quicker we can move from that to learning and then to grow, right? So we're going to have to figure out how to apply the things that Hatma says, and then we're going to to apply them. So I think that, that we, we're in the learning phase. I think everyone's in the learning phase right now. And that's that the more we can get on this, it's coming regardless whether you want it to or not, it's going to be here very quickly. And so I think that uh, that learning phase is going to be a very important one. I, I think just to add something real quick, I, one thing that we as a industry in affordable housing have a hard time doing is adapting to change, right? We, we have been trained a certain way, and this is the way it's always been. Um, I'm probably going to get into this more later on another soapbox that we talked about last night at dinner. But Do you have your soapbox <laughs> here yet? Can we bring it? I, I will tell you that this, this is a change that should demonstrably help us and as an industry. And if we can learn to adapt to it, um, I think the overall is going to be much better than the current state of things. I will say if y'all are like, oh, Hotma's new, it's really not new. Uh, it actually got signed um, by Congress. It got enacted in 2016. Um, so Dang, it's I've been, been saying around. 2019. We, what? I've been saying 2019. I was well, wrong. 16? You were you were close. You were so close. I mean, you gave it a pretty good cushion of time. The proposed regulation came out in 19. So that makes. That's what I was thinking. That's, That's what exactly thinking. what she was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so 2016, um, I will say we uh, have kind of been joking because the way it is written, it goes into effect on January 1st of whatever year they pick for it to be in effect. Uh, and someone said uh, at a conference, well, can't we just delay that? And I said, it's literally going to take an act of Congress to change that because it is statutory at this point. So um, stay tuned. I know that there's a lot of questions. Um, we are participating along with uh, several other people, uh, some in this room, in working group conversations. There's a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of things we're still waiting on. Um, and I told you that this was 2016. What else do we talk about that has been in the works forever that is tied with this? Jenny just mouthed it to me. It's our favorite topic, Tracks 203A. What? 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 203A? What? Yeah, so 203A, which we said probably would never going to happen. Um, thank you, Hotma. It is now joined at the hip with 203A, and it is happening together. So... One of the things that we've talked about with 203A and with the delays is we're waiting on forms. Guess what, guys? Guess what we're still waiting on? Forms. Yeah. Guess what? That deadline's not changing. So yay for us. So um, there are a lot of things coming. Um, as we mentioned, there's implications for HUD, but let's not forget about those implications for tax credit properties as well. Um, lots of unanswered questions, lots of talk about, well, can we delay the date? Mm, good luck. Uh, it's coming. So just stay tuned. What I will say is not everything that is in HOTMA is related to software. 
While there are certainly things related to it um, that will be updated in your software, you have other things to think about. You have changes to your leases. You have changes to your house rules. I think, Jenny, you said you might as well just throw them out the window because you're going to do all new ones, right? Um, changes to your tenant selection plans. There are a lot of things that you guys are going to be tasked with as property managers and property management companies to keep up with, make those changes. We'd help you if we could, but that part's on y'all. So I will say there are a lot of trainers in the industry and a lot of associations that are doing training on HOTMA. Um, just know Trax 203A kind of comes along for the ride. So our best recommendation to you is for goodness sakes, get some training um, you're certainly going to want it. Your site staff is going to need it. And then anything we can do to help or point you in the right direction, we're, we're happy to do it. Um, but just, just know it's coming and it's coming soon. And uh, one thing to think about too, Jenny, I don't know if we ever decided what to do with your, your AR. So we talk about it being effective January 1st. Well, that's cool. When do you guys start your January 1st ARs? September. Exactly. Uh, September is going to be here before you know it. So Jenny just said it's three months away. Like she thinks I can't do math, but <laughs> it's totally fine. She was just giving me an assist. Uh, I really am not good at math. So um, it's coming. And so I, I know that, that, you know, there's a lot of questions. I will say business as usual until HUD tells us otherwise. I would like to say that um, at a recent HUD uh, for, uh, Hot Muff for Tax Credits uh, webinar we did, we got the question, why did HUD spring us this on us so quickly? Yeah, and 2016, it, they sprung it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's statutory, and they actually released early Hot Muff, the final rule, so we'd have it in January, and then officially released it in the Federal Register in February. So they're bound by statute. It has to be the start of the following year after HUD regulates it. So they gave us as much time as we can. So it is a tight time. But I think that it wasn't, it's not like they're springing something on us without um, reason. Right. Um, you know what other gift they recently gave us? Mm. The final rule for Inspire. Ah, fun. How many of you love your property inspections that HUD comes out and does? <laughs> Nobody in the room got excited. Half the room just took a sip. So, yeah. So, Inspire. Uh, how many of you actually have heard of Inspire? Okay. Um, the rest of you, brace yourselves. The rest of them are clearly conventional. The rest of them are going to come walking up here. They're, They're just here for the cocktails. That's it. All right. Got it. Got it. Uh, so the Inspire demonstration has been around for a little bit. The goal of Inspire, and I think I, no, I didn't write it out, the acronym. Come to the session tomorrow. I wrote the acronym out. I don't remember. Um, but it is going to replace the UPCS standards for your property inspections. So... Uh, HUD published a final rule on May 10th, um, and they weren't playing around. So this is going to go into effect on July 1st for public housing properties. Anybody got any public housing? Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Uh, it, July 1st. Uh, for multifamily housing, for housing choice vouchers, for project-based vouchers, your deadline is October 1st. So you could just like squeeze that in and get used to something new just before that January hotma hits. So, so we're going to see two new things. Two new things. This is so die. exciting. I not don't know one, what happened. But two. In, huh? Not one, but two. I know. I don't know what is in the water at HUD, but they decided to start cranking out some stuff, guys. Uh, so Inspire. What do you think about Inspire? I know I talked to one of you did not participate. Did either of you participate in the demo, in the Inspire demonstration? I did. Scott Michael did not. Lane is still here and alive to tell us all about it. <laughs> so I, I, I think that initially I was extremely excited about Inspire because for any of you or all of you that have experienced a REAC inspection, you know how painful it is to get ready. You know how ridiculous some of the things that they write up are. You know how um, wildly different your inspector's personalities are whenever they show up on site. And that personality better mesh with somebody at the property that is walking with you. Otherwise, you might have an unintended consequence happen. Uh, and I wish that was <laughs> not true, but I literally just experienced a REAC inspection a month and a half ago in which a REAC inspector for my, the first time in my entire career called HUD while they were there and asked a question that then she stood on the phone and talked with them for 45 minutes about 
not just that thing that she was curious about, but four or five other things that she had witnessed while she was at the property that, quite frankly, we just so everybody were clear, we still passed the inspection, we were fine, but that's how these people could not interpret React inspections. Um, so at the on the face of Inspire, whenever it rolled out uh, for the demonstration period, pre-COVID, I was very excited because I knew all of those things existed, right? And I was really looking forward to a much more uniform inside the building, inside the units that we can hold residents accountable for their actions type of inspection and you're not worried about trees that are overhanging my building because that's crazy. Um, yes, we should worry about the building envelope, but let's also talk about the costs of those things that you're also not paying me to fix. Um, so I digress. The point I'm trying to make. I was going to say, somebody, somebody got really excited. Somebody else there. agreed with so, you. Remember I said soapbox earlier, right? Soapbox. Yeah. It's a everybody real thing. just take a sip and calm down. <laughs> All right. But the, the, the overall point that I'm trying to make is as we went through the demonstration, what we found out was HUD really rolled this demonstration out without any clue of what they were trying to accomplish. So as owners, if you were part of this inspection process, you had no knowledge of what your inspection results were. You had no real access to receive the results that were completed on site. And then as you got further down the line and further into the Inspire demonstration, what we quickly learned was HUD's inspectors really didn't even know the rules either. And so we, this was all started by some Congress involvement, which everything at HUD starts by, for a portfolio that existed in the Southeast, to be mentioned another time. If you want to talk more about it, find me at the bar later. Um, but it was initiated by failing results at a property where you had literal stairs collapsing inside of units, mold, pest control issues, things that you wouldn't want your worst enemy living in. This was the initiative that started Inspire through Congress. And so they rushed it out quickly, unlike Hotma, which was seven years baking in the oven. Um, and we, we got to a place that really allowed us to say bye to React, but also not really understand this new program that was coming out. Um, and so in the last year, we've had a lot of really good dialogue with HUD. We've had a lot of really good conversations that we think has impacted the scoring, but I can also assure you there's still some weird nuance that is existing within this new Inspire program that's rolling out October 1st that a lot of us aren't really certain on what these things are going to do to your lenders, to your stakeholders whenever they see these scores and things of that nature. So. I'm excited overall because React goes away and the craziness that comes along with it, but I think my overall view of Inspire is certainly one that is to be determined because there's just a lot of unknown, but we need to embrace it because it does get after the things that we need to be paying attention to, which is inside the buildings and inside residence units. The uh, comment is particularly on how many properties could pass and yet have all kinds of problems in the units. And one of the features of Inspire is you can't pass if the units have a significant number of problems. It's kind of a two-part final scoring. Well, I'm glad that inspection turned out okay for you, Lane. Yeah. Uh, sure. Because no one ever gets excited when somebody calls HUD in the middle of the inspection. Uh, when he told us that story, I was like, that's the first time I've heard it too. And like, I'm just... What are we supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, that just makes you feel warm and fuzzy all over when your inspector's like, hold my beer, I'm gonna have to make a phone call to HUD. So... Can I, uh, one point about the tax prep program. We're still a little unclear and we're waiting for some clarity from the IRS. It would appear that just like HOTMA, Inspire would automatically apply because of regulation that refers to UPCS in the um, tax credit regulation is referring to the part that will now be Inspire. So it would seem automatic that we will have Inspire on the tax credit side and probably October 1st, the IRS, probably because we just had a two year long knockdown drag out fight over the average income test was a little bit scared when all of a sudden owners are mad about having this. And so they're not really giving us an answer yet, but as soon as we know, we'll 
the informing the industry on whether that October 1st date for inspire applicability to tax credits will actually uh, happen or will that be later down the road? Do we want to take bets on each state does their own thing? Because that, that's never happened That before. would be so shocking for yeah. a tax credit property. It's really? not as bad as you think. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't even say it with a straight a face. <laughs> he couldn't even say it with a straight face. Um, back to Lane's inspection, though, because one of the things Lane said that I thought was so interesting after we um, had a stroke about the inspector Colin Hud in the middle of it was um, Lane made a comment that says, you kind of wonder... Like, if the inspector steps in a pothole and files a workers' comp claim, do you still pass your inspection? I, I, I have to imagine they don't, but no, you no automatically way. fail because they just stop the inspection. I mean, you at that work point, you were already worried about your inspection anyway, so I, you were like, well, this might as well just I may or too. may not have hoped that actually happened. I wasn't going to say that, but I you went like, there, so... I feel um, like you I was, should get a redo. <laughs> you should get we, a redo? We passed. Yeah. Remember, we passed, oh, so yeah, it's fine. Oh, yeah, that's right. Never mind. We don't oh, so you're good. No, no redo. big deal. No redo. <laughs> It appears is that on the, with the preliminary numbers that those that used to do well will probably do as well or better. Those that did poorly in the past will do worse. And so that seems to be the direction they're going. The other thing is just to be prepared for the shock. Everything's health and safety. Yes. Everything. Yeah. Everything's yeah. a health and safety issue. So just be prepared for that. Yeah, and there are certainly some guidelines that came out in the final rule, too, about what your turnaround time is to fix those. Um, submitting results to HUD. There's some... Things in the final rule, too, about self-inspections. Um, they are still t sticking to the 3-2-1 rule. So depending on your score, you don't have to have a REAC inspection every year unless your score is below a 60, which is great. So there are some good things that uh, are staying as part of it. But um, we've certainly heard the same thing talking with people that it's either gonna, your score is probably going to be really good or really not so good. So um, good luck. Good luck to you all. Um, uh, yeah, have fun with that. But let's let's face it. I mean, when you ask someone how long they've been in the industry, you say how long you've been in, right? It's like we're in prison. <laughs> For me, it's been 30 years. And just slightly after I started, UPCS right. was was introduced. It has not substantively changed in 25 years. And so. <laughs> It feels a little time. outdated. That took it longer than 203A. For a reform. <laughs> that feels more outdated than I am. Yeah. So <laughs> my only commitment uh, to my wife longer than to affordable housing by six months. So um, it's it's a long term thing here. But the um, you you called the first one prison. Were you gonna? No. Okay. No, that's a whole, that's unending bliss. All right. Just I'm just checking. Just checking. <laughs> But the the fact is it needed to be rehabbed. And so and then from here every three years they'll be reassessing. So there'll be opportunity for feedback and they seem to have demonstrated every inclination to take feedback. So I think that we'll have a, a, a revised uh, version as we go forward that'll probably get closer to what we need. And I, I think that that point is the most important point out of all of it is for the first time in my career, HUD has actually set timetables to review their own policies and change them as they see fit or as they experience difficulties with them. And that's a big deal. It really is. Yeah, that was actually written into the final rule that they agreed to review the standards every three years, um, which is great. Is that an indication they're getting easier to work with? As you know. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I think certain offices. Out I, there. I, I think wow. certain offices within <laughs> HUD certainly certain are. are certainly, and, yeah. I, and I actually would say REAC because um, I know Ash comes and speaks Absolutely. quite quite frequently at NAMA. Um, she's actually doing a session on Inspire at NAA as well. Nice. So oh, wow. I do know that they've had a lot of listening sessions. They are open to feedback. So um, I I do give them credit for that. That's awesome. So so it's coming, Scott Michael. Yeah. One day, you'll get to experience the same joy that Lane did. Well, we <laughs> have a lot of HUD <laughs> properties, so I just keep it. So I got two hats. I got the consultant hat, which is mostly tax credit home side. But then I, because I, I'm terrified of ever being bored, I'm also an executive for a property management company with 5,000 units, and that has lots of HUD. So it's not like I can ignore HUD. I just don't have to teach y'all. <laughs> On the there you side. go. He he just punted that one to you, Jenny. Is what Jenna. I heard. Jenny's Call got Jenna. a lot. <laughs> tax credit and home. You want to know about hot month for those? I am your. I'm right there for you. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, just watching our time. One of the other things that we talked about um, that's getting a lot of buzz in the industry lately is a lot of talk about that next generation. And so Scott, Michael, and I were talking about this. Um, there there was 
a trainer who was very predominant on the tax credit side, one on the HUD side, they retired at the same time, and we said, well, who's the heir apparent? Um, who Who's going to fill those shoes? Um, and at NAMA, we had our strategic planning meeting uh, earlier this year, and we talked about it even from a membership you know, perspective of what's that next generation uh, of members look like? But you guys are having the same issue in your companies as well, talking about how do you attract talent? How do you keep that talent? So tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing in terms of succession planning and looking for that next generation of leaders in your companies. Think in the interest of time, Lane had the soapbox. Uh, please, please go ahead. I, <laughs> I, I absolutely defer to you for sure. And then I will pick up the pieces. <laughs> Well, I have, I'll just put some observations both here at conferences like this. Um, there's a lot less young people than we used to have, right? When we're, when we're like the younger ones in a group, in a room. Um, and so trying to find and attract that generation and then give them, and, and I know that I don't want to step on, on lane spots here too much, but some path forward that makes them feel immediately engaged that they'll stay because that seems to be what's necessary. Uh, for them to take a hold and to, and to stay, but it, it's mission critical along with centralization. But I think right now we'll talk about staffing more importantly. Um, that we need to find ways to engage that younger generation because it's not. I mean, it is true that the industry is aging, and if you're young, great, please stay with us. It's it's a great career, um, but we we have noticed that in our company as well as in the industry, the aging of the group. Well, and your company is interesting too, um, Scott Michael, in the sense that it was a family business. And one of the things that we talked about that we, Rue and I would see this at NAMA all the time is there's certainly a lot of family businesses and you see that next generation come in and take over. We're seeing that, but that's not always the case. We are seeing some cases where that next generation says, no, thank you. Uh, I don't want to do that. So that was the case with Costello. Yes. The fourth generation. And the fourth generation said, no, we're, we're going to do our attorneys and doctoring and all of that, and, but not property management. And so then the owners had to think through what their succession plan was and how to engage other outside people that they trusted to become owners in their company because they you know, um, probably won't last forever <laughs> based on history. So um, still wonderfully engaged in, in the business, but needing to uh, go a little farther, even within a family, sure thing, right? They could stay and be that next generation. That was not their what they wanted to do. So we, we have to think through all that carefully. So uniquely on a podcast, you don't get to do this regularly, but we have a whole group of people here since we're live. I'm curious, what? give me a show of hands on site-level folks that are in the room right now. Couple, all right. How about compliance, corporate-level staff? Ooh, and then lot. that's a lot. That's my piece. <laughs> so you're all here <laughs> to hear him and not so much me. It's fine. <laughs> About executive level team members uh, for any of your organizations. Okay. So almost equal from uh, the site level folks that are here. So my, my biggest fear for this industry is exactly what Janelle just described. So I go to conferences uh, for NAMA. For Sama, um, hope I'm trying really hard to get Mama back um, with a few other folks to national prominence. It's it's a labor of love. We would like that. No, I we were laughing at the whole. Everybody teases about the whole Lama Jama Sama Pama yeah, all yeah. Of that. So yeah, keep going. The Mama, mama the Mama, mama should thing, come back. It should come back. Um, and we're trying hard. I um, love Mama. <laughs> I got a new one. Somebody called NAA Na the other day. <laughs> uh, Go to Na Go to <laughs> But the the point overall is, so I go to these conferences, and just like Janelle described, I see a lot of folks that are um, not like myself, right? They're not younger folks. They are not folks that are um, going to be around in probably 10 years, and that might be generous. Um, and I say that mainly because we as an industry in the affordable space specifically, I think conventional, we could learn some things from in this area as we're identifying folks in the conventional space a lot faster to say like, yes, you get it, you understand it. We want to grow with you and we want to help you grow. In the affordable space, you get these 
niche folks that are very good at very specific things. And we pigeonhole them and say, you're going to be our community manager at this property because we need you to be really successful and we need this property to be really successful. And then from that, where do you go? Who is focused on their development, their um, pathway to get to the regional manager spot? Who's focused from that regional manager who is also very good that goes and puts out literally every fire in your organization? Who's focused on getting that person the time they need to step away and get mentored and understand the next level of leadership? And then from there, whether it's an executive level spot or you have something else that exceeds the RPM level in your organization, how do they get from there to the C-suite? Because every organization, and we see them all the time at every conference, is represented on the ownership level or at the C-suite level by folks that are very close to retirement or quite frankly, are past retirement age. And there is no plan to get them um, out of their seats and find people that can fill those seats. So I have challenged a lot of people over the last probably two or so years, specifically in the pandemic, definitely, to really dive deep into your folks at the site level that are doing well. Find ways to mentor them. Yes, our business is crazy busy. We have no time to spend on an hour of leadership development or an hour on understanding how to uh, develop better soft skills to move up that corporate ladder, if that's something that they wanna do. But for me, I can't tell you enough that there is not enough stories like mine that exist out there that started at as, as an assistant community manager working at a property in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to learn the industry, but also be given the opportunities to develop my own pathway to sit here and talk to all of you today. And I, I really hope that those of you that are out there that have the decision-making power, that have the abilities to um, make the choices for your, your industry, for your teams, um, I hope that you can find those pathways for those folks because if you don't, we're going to be in a spot in, again, five to ten years, and I think ten is on the back side of this, that is going to really harm this industry because we're not helping the people that need to develop get to the places that they need to go. Yeah. And I think um, um, we have a unique industry to do that in because it's a mission, right? It's more than just housing. I thought I have a similar path from site up to where I'm at. Um, and... Um, a lot of it had to do with, I think, why did I stick with this? Because there were certainly more profitable things I could have done with my life. But <laughs> <laughs> there is a mission element. And I think that cultivating that in people, right, under, besides a place where there's, there's room for growth here, but also look at what good you're doing. And I think if we get that message out internally to our staff, do you have a mission statement that focuses on that? Do you, do you work? every day to make sure that your team understands that what they do is much more important than just the job. It has implications for, for your communities, communities at large, your state, and your nation. And so if we can get that message and, and truly believe it ourselves and, and, and cultivate it, people people stay. And I think that generation that kind of likes to switch around these days, it, it's somewhat mission-based. They want to do something that they feel is important. We have that mission. Let's make sure we let everyone know about it. Yeah, and that was one of the things that we, when we talked about this, um, we did say that there are some generational challenges um, that we're facing, and part of it is that mission base. And so it's how do you explain to them that they're dealing with people's homes, right? They don't look at them as apartments; they're homes, right? Kind of in the theme with with the conference, all all about um, homes and finding homes for people and, and keeping those going. So, are there any parting thoughts? on these topics or any other burning things on your mind, things that your challenges you're facing at your companies, anything else you want to share before we wrap up? Well, I think that across society in general, staffing is a problem everywhere, right? And we just celebrated 15% vacancy in our, our portfolio recently because we got down to that. Um, it's hard to fill positions. That's why it's so important, again, just like you talked about. But, but I do think something that we as an industry have to solve is the ability to centralize. So 
application processing is complicated. It's more difficult than ever. Compliance people are operating on attorney levels, right? And we're somehow expecting in many organizations sites to figure this out. They're sending stuff to compliance. It keeps getting kicked back. They're totally frustrated with their job satisfaction. Pulling those duties, we've been successful with both vacancy loss, uh, compliance results, and um, other metrics with centralizing some of that application processing. But to succeed, we need our friends in the industry with software to really help with that too. We need to have online solutions. We, what we've created was just cobbling together DocuSign and some other things, but but really working toward a solution. And a resume's working on other uh, vendors. That is going to be mission crucial to succeed with a dwindling workforce. And you get better results, at least that's been our experience, with, with experts doing that processing of application. So I can't overstate enough how, how I'm looking as an executive for that solution, and I think the industry is as well. Mike? So I'm going to go back to what I was saying, actually, and bring a little bit more levity, because it's not all doom and gloom, right? So uh, what I was actually talking with some folks at lunch about, and Janelle and I spoke about whenever we were prepping for this, along with Rue, was you know, there's a place for folks that also want to um, stay at the site. They enjoy that that work that is absolutely necessary. And this isn't meant as a slight to anybody. And I don't want that to come across this way because it's more funny than it is anything. I try to bring Caddyshack into every conversation that I have. And if you haven't watched Caddyshack, please take some time in the next couple of days to do so. It's a great movie. It's, you will laugh and you'll laugh hysterically. But one of the great lines that is very true in life, the world needs ditch diggers too, Danny. And that, that doesn't necessarily need, mean that our folks on the site are ditch diggers. They're, they're absolutely required for the success of all of our organizations. And they have to be a critical part of your conversation and if you are talking to them on a regular basis about what they want and what they need from a professional and personal development plan, then you will have those folks out there that actually really care and buy into what you're doing. And it will only make your company stronger. So don't be afraid to go and find those ditch diggers as well. Yep. Well, I certainly appreciate both of you being here, joining Rue and I. So thank you very much for that. Um, as always, Rue and I wrap up our podcast talking about where you can find us next. No surprise, you'll probably find this crowd at the bar. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, there is the legislative update session that's coming up, um, the general session this afternoon. Um, we are excited about the customer dinners tonight. Uh, tomorrow morning, we've got... Or, all day tomorrow, we have more sessions happening in this room, talking about some of these additional topics that we've covered. So beyond that, um, Rue and I are excited. We're going to be doing this podcast again live in two weeks at NAA. We're super excited that we were selected as one of four affordable sessions in their entire educational track. So uh, look for us in matching outfits again at NAA. Um, and our podcast is part of Prop Talk. And you can find that on Spotify, Apple, anywhere you find podcasts. And we just appreciate you coming. And by all means, if you've got questions or want to keep talking on these topics, please find any of us the, for the rest of the week. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>